Hello, I'd like to talk a bit about procedural generation. Procedural generation is one of those techniques that I think is not used as much as it could be, um, but is really a piece of magic whereby a, a vast amount of content, of rich content, can be created um, that would otherwise take a long time to make. So an example in Elite of how procedural generation worked is the whole galaxy was laid out by the computer. In other words, it, it drew all the star systems one by one around the galaxy, placed them based on what looked like random numbers. So it would, it would essentially roll a dice and say, right, okay, there's a star here, roll the dice again, there's another star here. And that process would continue until all 256 stars were in the galaxy. When I say roll the dice, it would be generating a random number. And that random number came from a, a ran, what's called a random number sequence. So although the ran numbers look random, they would actually be the same each time. So whenever it generated the galaxy, it would generate exactly the same galaxy each time. So talking a little bit about how that's done, um, you start off with something called a seed. So here we have a seed, which is the numbers one, two, three, four. And then it just add those together. Now this isn't actually the sequence that was used in Elite. It was a bit more complex one, but it shows very quickly you see um, but when you add them together, you get the next numbers in the sequence and so forth. Now, let's imagine taking those numbers and just looking at the last two digits. So forget the upper digits. So here we see there's a sequence going forward. To the eye, that looks pretty random. And actually, if you put a lot of analysis tools, mathematical analysis tools onto it, it does, it is random. It has the same properties, you even distribution, all that sort of thing. Not particularly this sequence, which was um, from a guy called Fibonacci many years ago, but other sequences have um, much better sort of characteristics. Now, so what Elite did is it, it ran these and it can run them really, really quickly for the whole galaxy. And it took a tiny fraction of a second to lay out the whole galaxy this way. And what you can do is just look in the sequence to see which ones are near you and then plot them on a map. And, and that's how it worked. Now, it also, as an extension of that, you say, okay, we've got this... Um, planet that's at coordinates 25, 76 or whatever, you say, what should we call it? Well, you can say, t take the same philosophy to, to, to choose its name. With Frontier, we took that a step further. Um, the, what happened there is whole star systems were created. As you go to increase the distance away from the star, mass increases and then tails off until you get all the way out towards um, Pluto and the uh, distant asteroids and very, very cold bodies. Now, within that mass is distributed the momentum, and there are, there are a lot of there's a lot of science which I won't go into here, which is why it's distributed the way the way it is. Interestingly, we also have within our own solar system a number of subsolar systems which have very very similar properties. So, for example, if you look at Saturn, you look at Jupiter, uh, you'll see that again they have a mass distribution around them. You have Saturn with its rings, which Everyone believes, including me, that they're quite transient and therefore some, some body that collapsed and formed those rings. But nevertheless, you have a mass distribution around Saturn which has very, very similar ratios. What happened with Frontier is I made those assumptions and just saw what came out randomly, again using the same technique we've described, saw what came out randomly and whether the solar systems look realistic. Now, incredibly, they did. With Frontier, of course, it was before a single planet was discovered. So it's very exciting as we go forward, as more and more planets are discovered, um, that real life gets <laughs> seems to be getting close to that. I'm a huge fan of science fiction films. And one of the problems that I thought with, with Frontier and with the First Encounters game is the surfaces were marble hard. And I think that is a real shame when you're talking about gas giants like Saturn, like Jupiter, like Uranus, like Neptune. What I imagine would be the case, particularly with Jupiter, where you've got a very active, very colourful atmosphere, is it would, there would be towering clouds everywhere. There would be lightning strikes. The world is a very, very interesting world. And it would be beautiful to fly in amongst those clouds with spaceships. So one of the technologies we've been looking at is how do we do that? How do we generate really rich cloudscapes? So um, it's early days yet, but here is um, an example of such a piece of technology. What we're seeing here is, again, using procedural techniques, generating clouds on the fly, and you can feel yourself flying through them. We can have layers of these, we can change the colors, but imagine how great that will feel, visiting a system uh, like Jupiter, 
You know, it, it doesn't have to be empty. There can be other people there. There can be people getting gas from the system because um, we've already already know in both Elite and Frontier you could uh, scoop fuel from the surface. Um, you know, a gas giant's actually a very good place to do it because it's not quite as hot as the sun. But also, of course, these techniques can apply to the surfaces of stars, particularly cold stars um, like red giants. And so or, I think bringing that sort of richness to the world that um, we just haven't yet seen in games, I think is very, very exciting what it would look like, uh, what the world would feel like to fly through. And just from a gameplay point of view, tactically, you can lurk in clouds where maybe people can't see you because there are electrical storms which make your, your scanners not work very well. You know, all of those things, I think, um, are very exciting going forwards. Now, there are plenty of more things we can do from the layouts of planet surfaces, all that sort of thing. So I, th I think the, the richness we can bring to the world with procedural generation, still as a, as a way of helping what artists can do, is very exciting. One of the issues, in fact, questions that come up a lot with procedural generation is um, just how good the results will be. And I think that what's in the back of people's minds is whether it will feel very samey. Um, now, obviously that's very possible, and it depends how you use it. Because one of the things that I've been saying with this is um, it's a way of augmenting what artists do. And if you think of the procedural generation as essentially following the steps in a recipe, what the artists are doing is providing the ingredients. And if the ingredients are varied enough, then so is the end result. So um, if you compare, for example, a national park in the US, like the Joshua Tree National Park, where you've got um, slightly weird looking cacti, big boulders all placed around the place in what looks like a very strange way, but incredibly beautiful. Compare that with, say, a national park in the UK, where you've got mature oak trees, very, very different feel to it, different color palette, how it works, different shape of the landscape. They could both be done by the same technique, but look completely different. And it's the content that comes from the artist that makes it feel different. That's true however it's done, whether it's layouts of planets, um, cloudscapes, what's in there. And so I think that is what provides the richness and the range. And that's what we intend to do here. So I think used carefully, used well, the results can be really good. And that's how we plan to do it. <laughs>